Well, uh, why don't we get started? Uh, good evening and welcome to this Smilo Cancer Hospital and Yale Cancer Center Patient and Family Forum. I'm Dr. Charlie Fuchs and I'm the physician in chief of Smilo Cancer Hospital and the director of the Yale Cancer Center. I know I speak for all of my colleagues uh, with me today that we are just so grateful that you've taken the time this evening to join us for this special forum on the COVID-19 pandemic. I'm joined this evening by several members of our outstanding team at Smilo, and as I, uh, as I call your name, maybe just wave or raise your hand so we know who's who. Uh, first, I want to introduce Dr. Kevin Billingsley, Chief Medical Officer at Smilo Cancer Hospital and an internationally recognized leader in surgical oncology. Maureen Rauchi, a Patient Services Manager of Inpatient Medical Oncology and the Extended Care Clinic at Smilo Cancer Hospital and one of our many talented nursing leaders at our center. Dr. Tara Samf, Chief Patient Experience Officer and a leading member of our breast cancer program. Uh, Bonnie Indek, Manager of Oncology Social Work at Smilo Cancer Hospital. Maggie Zampano, a senior clinical nurse at, for our inpatient gynecologic oncology and breast oncology units, and Dr. Jeremy Kormansky, a deputy chief network officer at Smilo Cancer Hospital and a leading medical oncologist at our North Haven Care Center. Um, as many of you know, over the years, we've done a number of forums for our patients and families to share the work that we're doing in our cancer center and covering a range of topics and speakers. More often uh, when we do that, we're usually all in the same place and, uh, and enjoying the, the environment of a nice auditorium. But in the spirit of social distancing, as you can see, we're all in different locations using the current technology of Zoom to speak with you. And tonight, um, in particular, we wanted to speak with you and keep you informed and updated on our continuous efforts to confront the challenge of the COVID-19 pandemic. As you all well know, we're living through an extraordinary and unprecedented time. Nonetheless, my colleagues who are joining me tonight and countless other dedicated individuals working in our cancer center have been working over the past many weeks to prepare our cancer center for this pandemic. And most importantly, we, uh, we want to ensure that our patients continue to receive expert, compassionate, state-of-the-art cancer care at each of our 16 Smilo sites across Connecticut and Rhode Island. And that is something, that is a principle throughout this time we're committed to. As you, many of you are probably aware, we've instituted a number of changes at our center in order to continue to have our ability to provide outstanding care during this pandemic. And tonight's speakers and panelists will be review, reviewing many of those new approaches with you as we address this challenge. Uh, for tonight's agenda, uh, I wanna just briefly review the, the agenda for you, which is following my introductory remarks. We'll be hearing from uh, Dr. Billingsley, Maureen Rauchy, and Dr. Samp. Um, and then after that, and I think for the brunt of our time, we will be uh, fielding questions from you and allowing all of our six experts to, uh, to address those questions and uh, allow uh, some time for you to be fully informed of how we're, how we're doing this and how we can best provide care for you in a safe and effective way. Um, but before we uh, turn it over to our speakers and panelists, I just want to review some important basic information on COVID-19. As you know, this is a highly infectious virus capable of easily transmitting between people, typically spreading through respiratory droplets, such as when a person coughs or sneezes. Um, the typical symptoms uh, that patients may report, although not always, include fever, cough, trouble breathing, muscle aches, fatigue, or loss of taste or smell. And, and in fact, what we hear from many individuals is that that loss of taste or smell may be the first sign of when they develop the virus. Moreover, for many, if not most individuals infected with COVID-19, the symptoms can actually be mild. 
but we clearly recognize that for some individuals, these symptoms can actually be quite serious. Um, whether you're a cancer patient or not, as you know, there are a number of things that we can do to reduce our risk of getting the virus. And I just want to take a moment to review that with you because it is so important. First and foremost, practice good hand washing. And you probably heard 20 seconds with soap and water or an alcohol-based sanitizer. You know, often said, you know, wash your hands while you're singing the chorus of happy birthday twice. So make sure you really scrub. Stay at home, can't say that enough, and particularly for patients undergoing treatment for cancer during this time period. And really uh, allow others to do things for you. If for those people who do have to travel, as you know, the state is asking us to limit our travel to the essentials, groceries, pharmacy, medical care. But to our patients, I would say, given the advent of delivery services, don't travel to those places. Have, have they, these things delivered to you. Avoid close contact. Keep six feet away from indivi between individuals. And certainly avoid contact with anyone who may be ill or care in COVID-19, including if that happens to be individuals in your household. And finally, and no less important, monitor your health at home and watch for these symptoms. Take your temperature twice a day, monitor for fever, watch for the other signs or symptoms that we've described. What happens, what, what do you do if you develop symptoms like this? Well, first and foremost, call your doctor or the healthcare facility before visiting. Can't emphasize this enough, enough. We want you to call first before you head into an emergency room or a care center. And we're always available 24 seven. For people who have general questions about the virus, you can, you, there is a, uh, a line that Yale New Haven Health has, has, which is online. For those of you who don't see the slides, it's 833-275-9644. But um, again, that's available online and those resources and others are available through our health system, through the Centers of Disease Control, CDC, among others. So with that introduction, I wanna turn it over to Dr. Billingsley. Uh, to share his insights on how we're approaching this. Thank you very much, Dr. Fuchs. <clears throat> and I would also like to extend my very sincere uh, note of gratitude to all of our Smilo community who is joining us this evening in this difficult time. Although we wish we could be together in person, at least uh, having this virtual connection is the very next best thing. I wanna address two of the priorities that we have set out as we um, aim to help our patients uh, continue their, their cancer care throughout the course of this uh, difficult pandemic that we're all dealing with. May I have the next slide, please? Our priority number one is ensuring ongoing patient safety. And there are several key principles that we are, are following to ensure the highest levels of, of patient safety as we continue to care for you and all of our cancer patients. Our top priority is doing everything we can to maintain a safe physical separation of our cancer patients coming in and out of our treatment centers and our hospitals from individuals who may or are infected with the COVID-19 virus. To this end, we have actually moved the majority of our inpatient care from our uh, Spilo patient tower to the St. Raphael's Yale New Haven Hospital campus. This is not a permanent move. This is a temporary move while we all weather this difficult time. And the reason we chose to execute this move at this time is that it does allow us to effectively um, isolate and secure our group of patients from the high level of, of traffic moving in and out of the York Street campus and increasingly many of those patients coming in to the York Street campus uh, will be under investigation for COVID or may even have the virus itself and we'd like to keep our vulnerable patients as securely sequestered as we can. To the point of patient safety, 
I'd like to uh, share with you all something that our teams have developed and are deploying the next couple of days. We are beginning something called the Smilo Rapid Evaluation Clinic. Uh, and this is really the, the brainchild of our uh, VP of Patient Services, uh, Kim Slusser, and her team of nurse leaders, as well as our uh, physician leaders. The aim of this center is to provide a, uh, a physically distinct location where our patients can be greeted and quickly evaluated for symptoms and signs that are concerning for possible COVID-19 infection. Um, our patients are a unique group as sometimes their symptoms uh, are related to treatment or the disease itself, the, the, dis the disease cancer itself, yet we have to quickly and efficiently rule out um, COVID-19 infection. And this uh, center will be on the York Street campus. And this is one of the reasons that, as Dr. Fuchs mentioned, we are urging folks to call ahead so that we can guide you to this uh, rapid evaluation clinic and uh, keep you out of other parts of the hospital, keep patients and families out of the emergency department, which will be a complicated place to be the next several weeks. Also, to the aim of patient safety, we are working very closely with the surgical oncologists on our SMILO team, addressing the case-by-case -case timing of cancer surgery procedures. This is difficult because during this pandemic, time in the hospital is going to be difficult. Uh, there will be risks of uh, the infection from other patients in the hospital, as well as challenges related to uh, ICU care, and blood bank supplies. So our team of our multidisciplinary teams have uh, have created uh, a series of guidelines to help us work with patients and families and their surgeons on individual decisions uh, to to help us optimize the timing of surgical care during this uh, difficult period while we are um, facing the high likelihood of, of uh, COVID-19 infection around uh, the, the region. Next slide, please. Our second priority, and perhaps equally important, is to preserve uninterrupted access to cancer care services. Um, the accessibility of our care centers has always been something that we have pr prided ourselves on. Our aim has been for our patients and families to have access to world-class cancer care within 30 minutes of their home, virtually any place in the state of Connecticut. Well, we aim to continue this to the greatest degree we can during this, this uh, period of challenge. There may be periods where we have to consolidate our care center service uh, related to fluctuations in uh, provider uh, staffing levels and nurse staffing levels. Uh, patients and families will be informed and kept absolutely up to date on those changes. I'm also pleased to uh, share with you that we have had great success in deploying our telehealth services. This has allowed patients to have a significant number of clinic visits from the comfort and safety of their own homes. Um, we have initiated these services across the array of the disciplines in the Cancer Center, and we will continue to do, do so in the next, uh, in the coming weeks and months. Our nurses uh, are working extremely hard with our pharmacists and physicians to provide absolutely uninterrupted service in our infusion units. Again, there may be consolidations or some movement in these sites, but our overarching aim is to allow patients to continue to receive ongoing cancer therapy in an absolutely uninterrupted way. Our extended care clinic, which is an important site for uh, patient evaluation with symptoms, signs, or treatment-related toxicities, will continue to be open during this period, however, in a different location on the York Street campus, again, away from the main flow of patient traffic in a secure location. 
Um, once again, I will urge patients and families to call ahead um, prior to coming to see us in the extended care clinic. So with that, I will just underscore our ongoing commitment to uh, safety and access. And uh, thank you all for joining us and uh, turn, turn to um, our nursing leaders and uh, ask uh, for additional contributions. Thank you. Kevin, thank you. Um, and I think we'll turn it over now to Maureen Rauchi. Maureen, did you want to share a few thoughts? Absolutely. So thank you to everyone for joining us tonight. Um, and I just wanted to reiterate and add to what Dr. Fuchs and Dr. Billingsley have already shared, that in true SMILO fashion, um, we have proactively um, approached this COVID outbreak in a patient-centered uh, fashion as we always do. And so we have come together as we always do with the patient at the center of every decision um, and made the right choices to ensure that our teams are able to stay together as one team to provide care. So in that light, um, all of our inpatient units, 12, 14, and 15, moved together as teams of nurses and physicians and caregivers so that we could provide holistic patient-centered care um, throughout the continuum and throughout this crisis to our patients. Great, thank you. Uh, I want to turn it over to Dr. Tara Sanf. Hi, thank you. Um, I just want to say, first of all, um, thank you for all of you participating. We have almost 400 participants, and I know that there would be familiar faces in the crowd if we were all together right now. And um, we're here for you. We see you. Um, and, you know, tonight is just about connecting and, and keeping us all together as a community. And, um, and thank you, Charlie, Kevin, and Maureen. Um, for your words, I, I hope um, those on the line can really feel the conviction that um, every decision being made is patient-centered and that we are committed to continuing this amazing enterprise um, and delivering the best cancer care possible. Um, and you know, just the other part of my role as chief patient experience officer is to make sure our providers are healthy and um, from an emotional and spiritual and physical point of view, um, this is a really challenging time for, for all of us. And so from a provider standpoint, we've really been trying to stay connected. Um, we've started a buddy system where we check in on each other. Uh, we've um, had various venues where we could show support and just talk about our experiences. And so I just wanted to assure all of you that, um, that we're doing our best to stay um, healthy and positive and on top of everything that's happening. Great, thank you, Tara. So um, we actually want to turn now to, uh, to questions, and we actually have a, a number of questions that have come in. Um, and Maggie, why don't we start with you, because a couple of questions that uh, probably you and others could answer that patients are asking, which is, um, patients are asking, you know, what can they do to protect themselves? You know, how, do, how would you answer that for our, for our patients and their families? Well, I think just exactly, you know, what you had reiterated at the beginning, first and foremost, you know, hand hygiene is so important. Um, and the self-quarantining, um, uh, you know, I know it gets a little monotonous and there's only so much Netflix you can watch, but to not be out in the community because there are people out there that don't have um, such, like you said, major symptoms, but they can be carrying the virus. So you know, our cancer patients are more susceptible for it. So asking loved ones or friends or family to go grocery shopping for them, uh, social distancing, you know, just really let the people in and out of your house that you know, um, you know, and just mask, if you can get a mask, wear a mask when you do have to go out. Thank you. And on a related note, Bonnie, um, how do, how do we advise our patients to address sort of the emotional and spiritual challenges uh, that we're facing? You know, it's hard enough, obviously, uh, trying to address the challenge of, cha of cancer, but in the midst of this pandemic, Bonnie, how would you, how would you advise patients and families on that? You're, you're on mute, Bonnie. Okay, thank you. Um, 
I think that it, there are certain things we have to do for ourselves. It's very easy to get overwhelmed in this time of um, many alerts coming through the phone or your TV, a lot of news bulletins. So control what you can control. Maybe shut off your alerts for a little while. Watch news maybe only once a day. Um, try to take care of yourself. Your emotional well-being right now is as important as your physical well-being. And um, we want to make sure that you do take care of yourself um, emotionally as well. So please continue healthy habits. Eat well, diet, uh, whatever works for you, whatever your dietitian has advised you to do. Uh, exercise if you're able to, most importantly, a good sleep habits, and take care of yourself and your family any way that's possible so that you stay as emotionally stable as possible. And there are many aids for this as well. There are a lot of apps you can use uh, for uh, relaxation and things of that nature. And we're happy to give that information. And later on, I can give you a phone number to call. If anybody needs any resources, we are very, very happy to help you with that. Thank you, Ronnie. Um, can I say one thing to that? Can I, I just heard, I heard a great point today, and I thought it was so important. Someone said routine. Routine is one of the most important things that the people right now, you know, in this pandemic can and have for themselves. So whether you create a new routine for yourself, but get up at a certain time, go to bed at a certain time. So you feel the normalcy that, you know, you normally, you know, what you normally do to so it doesn't feel so, you know, isolated. The other thing I want to add, please, is that, you know, everybody calls it social distancing, but I really like the term physical distancing better because we're still very social. We're talking to people on the phone. We're FaceTiming. We're using telehealth. We're reaching out to um, many people. So our social connections are still going on strong, but it's just the physical that we can't be close to each other. Thank you. Any, anyone else wanted to add to those questions? Well, let me just turn it because we have quite a few. Um, this one's uh, for Jeremy, Dr. Kermansky. Uh, patients are asking, um, in terms of getting outpatient therapy, how has that changed given the, all these changes? So I, I think that we've been addressing those issues with the patient's safety always in mind. And we've spent a lot of time across all of the different disciplines to uh, determine for which patients getting their care on time, every time is really important and which patients uh, we can make some adjustments so that we can make less touches to the healthcare environment. I think people worry about how they might get the virus. And, and one of those ways is every time that they come into a, a populated place, like our offices, like the hospital. And so if we can reduce that exposure, then we do. We, and that might be by changing the interval between your treatments. Uh, that might be uh, by switching to an oral equivalent therapy but we would never put your, you at risk in terms of your disease. That is always still our, that is always our priority. And so uh, we will treat you on time in the offices like we always do. Thank you, Jeremy. Uh, Maureen, um, some questions about uh, personal protective equipment. And, and I think others can answer as well, which is, um, should patients be wearing masks? Are the, are the people in clinic wearing masks? And, and what should be people doing even outside of the hospital or the ambulatory practice? Thank you, Charlie. That's a great question. And so I think we are all, you know, well aware of the hand washing and the keeping distance. As far as PPE, there's been lots of media attention on PPE. And here at Smilo and Yale New Haven Health, there are ongoing daily discussions and revisiting PPE and what is most appropriate to keep everyone safe. Those guidelines are addressed and readdressed on a daily basis to ensure that not only our staff, but our patients can be, um, can be kept safe. Thank you. Um, uh, Tara, uh, uh, questions. I know we covered a little bit of this, but maybe you could explain in more detail. Patients are asking, um, why were their appointments moved to telehealth? And you know, is that the same care as coming in to the, see the, the, 
the nurse practitioner or the or the physician? Yeah, thank you for this question. Um, you know, I think we started doing telehealth and telemedicine out of an abundance of caution to try to give this option for patients who didn't feel comfortable necessarily coming in for a regular clinic visit. As things have continued to rapidly evolve, this has become the preferred visit type, um, if at all possible. Now, again, I think to Jeremy's point, um, we are taking each case individually and we are reaching out to you. So if you're a patient who's on treatment or you have um, treatments coming up, you know, we are taking each decision seriously and we're deciding for each individual, um, should this visit happen as usual or should we offer um, telehealth visit? Now the telehealth visit is one that we can do via the MyChart app, which is through our electronic medical record system. Um, and we have ways to get you set up with all of that. Um, and if that's, if you're not a technology person, I know there's probably a lot of people listening on the phone, we offer tele, telephone visits as well. And um, the truth is that we get, you know, very good information just from talking with you. And so um, the state of the art care continues um, virtually as well as in person when needed. Tara, thank you. Uh, Kevin, Dr. Billingsley, a number of questions have come in about our, our pediatric uh, cancer patient practice. And so to what extent was the, either the inpatient or the outpatient changes, uh, were, was that, did that affect pediatrics? That is, did we move the pediatric ward to St. Rayfield's or were there any changes in our outpatient pediatric units? Um, <clears throat> thank you. <clears throat> Excuse me. There are some of our services that we have, we felt that it was best to leave in their current locations. Um, and pediatrics has been one of those. Those are services that have unique requirements related to the physical environment, the staffing requirements, or some combination thereof, that it just was not, um, it was not feasible to deliver the same level of uh, clinical expertise and um, service in a different location. Um, now that being said, what we have done to the point of safety is to put in place uh, kind of guardrails and processes to keep patients and their families coming in and out of the institution with as little exposure to other folks as possible. Um, and you know, one of the things that we have done is to, to try to manage traffic in some of the elevators so that we have limited elevator service to um, those floors in the Smilo Tower that continue to have uh, to, to serve our oncology patients. So uh, a, a number of questions, and I'll, I'll put this to both Maureen and Maggie about our, our visitor policies, both in and outpatient. And I wonder if you could explain that uh, to the attendees. Yes, absolutely. I'll start. So um, in an effort to keep our patients, um, our staff, and the community safe, we currently have no visitors in any of our hospital or ambulatory locations. There are some very site-specific um, exclusions to that criteria, but in general, there is currently a no visitor policy to ensure everyone's safety. And so that being said, um, we are doing our best to try to keep this normal for patients and we know how important it is for them to be in touch with their loved ones while they are inpatient. So we have been trying to help them FaceTime. Um, if you are having um, a treatment that lasts for several days and there's something you either left at home or you really wanted your family to bring you something, um, a staff member will go downstairs and meet the family and bring it back up to the patient. So we're doing our best, um, realizing how hard it is for the patients um, to not have, to be able to have visitors, but it's for the safety of the patients. And Bonnie, any suggestions for folks who are looking, who are anticipating or are currently in, in hospital who obviously are dealing with the fact that they can't have visitors? Sure. So, you know, we're doing our best certainly to reach out to those patients who are in the hospital and are feeling somewhat isolated right now and to work with them uh, to call their family to help communication uh, be facilitated. 
And we're also reaching out to patients and families that may be at home and have questions as well, but aren't on site. And so we're here to help everybody and do our best as we can to provide the emotional support that we would normally provide if we were seeing you face to face. So um, um, let me uh, uh, pose this next question to Tara. Um, patients asking, you know, should I sort of take the, my own initiative and delay or reschedule my appointments because I should just stay home? Uh, thank you for that. Um, I have a busy breast cancer clinic, and um, I know most of us are quite busy with our own patients. You know, again, I feel like uh, from my experience, it's best to have a conversation um, with my patients. I like to hear from them and, and to hear their thoughts about canceling or delaying. Uh, in survivorship, which is my other hat, um, many of those visits could certainly be delayed in a very safe fashion, and, and we've been doing that. Again, we're if you're listening on the line, we're reaching out to patients individually um, in a rapid fashion. So, um, so feel free to reach out to us, but you're also on our list. Um, you know, in, in terms of in-treatment patients, we are making some modifications to try to, again, minimize um, exposure when it's appropriate. And, and again, to just emphasize the theme here is to not compromise your cancer care at the same time. So bottom line is no one should sort of unilaterally decide to just cancel or delay, but call and ask, right? Yeah, again, I, I feel like um, we're all in this together and, and the doctors want to hear from you too. And we're, we're trying to take each case individually and, and really make a decision together. Uh, Jeremy, um, questions about, a number of folks are asking questions about, you know, they're scheduled for imaging studies as part of their routine care. CAT scans, PET scans, MRIs, should they cancel those? Should they delay them? What would you recommend? Uh, so echoing what, what Dr. Samt had said, I think it's always important to have the conversation with, with your physician about the safety of delaying those, the scans. I think if it is a routine surveillance scan and you're otherwise feeling well and the labs are normal, uh, then it probably is safe to to put that off until we're in a in a safer time. I think if those images are going to be integral to how we manage your disease, or if you are symptomatic, uh, then we need to push forward and, and get those done. And so I think all of this is about conversation. I wanted to add. I think if if you unilaterally cancel an appointment, we probably will call you to find out why that was um, so that we can have that conversation. Um, and I also wanted to say that even though we have visitor restrictions in the ambulatory setting as well, um, you could still participate in, in the meetings. So you can join in on speakerphone, in the office, on the, on the phone. Um, when you have a video visit, as many people as can fit around the table are welcome to join um, so there are, are still many ways to participate um, with, with your loved one during their appointments. Thank you. Um, uh, Dr. Billingsley, Kevin, um, a number of questions about getting tested for COVID-19. Um, you know, should cancer patients get tested routinely or how, how do you get a test? When should you get a test? Yes, Dr. Fuse, thank you for surfacing that. I've seen a couple of these come across the chat, and I think it's this is something that is on all of our minds. Um, let me start with kind of proactively addressing one that I saw come through about, should patients be taking their temperature? And what I would counsel in that regard is, uh, first off, as we've said over and over again, limit your exposure, stay at home. Now. If you find that you have come in contact with someone who later develops COVID-like symptoms, fever, cough, or you, are, you find out that you've been in proximity to someone who does indeed, uh, is, is actually diagnosed with COVID-19, then I would, would definitely rec recommend that you start um, taking your temperature twice a day, if at all possible 
as, as we are actually counseling our physicians and nursing staff to do. Um, and you know the temperature we're looking for is a kind of a indicator of concern is 100.5, and that would be a good trigger to to call and and let us help you think through the next steps. In terms of the actual uh, COVID testing itself, we are not recommending our patients uh, come in for any kind of testing if they remain asymptomatic or if they're having mild chemotherapy related symptoms. Now, those can be difficult to, it can be, it can be difficult to make that judgment call. Again, um, we ask that you keep in touch with your team. And that is one of the reasons that we've created uh, centers to evaluate our patients that are secure and away from the central care areas. But we are not, we are not recommending people have uh, COVID testing if they're asymptomatic. Thank you. Um, Maureen and Maggie, uh, some questions where individuals are asking if they develop a fever or they need to go to the hospital, should they think about going to another hospital because, for instance, Yale New Haven is so busy and maybe that's not a good place to go? Um, I would say no, they should not go to another hospital, that they should reach out to their care team as their primary providers for direction on how to proceed. And their care team will guide them, as they always have, to the right venue or next step. And I'm going to also add to that, that I know several people who have called the COVID hotline, and it's been very informative. And, um, you know, they have the screeners, but then I believe they also have uh, PAs, um, MDs, there as well that can guide patients on the next step. We don't want these patients at all, if can be avoided, coming into the emergency room. Thank you both. Uh, Bonnie and, and, uh, and, and Maggie and Tara as well, uh, a number of questions about, will we still be having support groups, classes, other events that we typically have for our patients uh, as we routinely provide care for them? Well, like so this event now, um, we've moved everything, I believe, to the virtual telehealth. Um, Bonnie, you could probably answer more about the social work visits um, and uh, the support groups. Right. So we are continuing to facilitate support groups. They are being done either through Zoom or through conference calls. And actually, our participation has increased. People who in the past have not wanted to, not wanting to drive a long distance now find it very easy to pick up a phone and participate. So it's really been um, a, a good thing that's come out of this. And we might actually have found a new workflow for some of our support groups. So we're really, really happy about that. And uh, we, continue, we will continue to do that. So if anybody wants to participate, we have a number of groups, some of which are disease related and others are more general. Please feel free to give the social work office a call and we will guide you. And Charlie, could I just say one thing, you know, um, part of the patient experience is to hear from you all. And so, um, I think you have a lot to teach us in general, um, having been through an event like cancer, and we can learn from you. But if there are things that you'd like to see Smilo doing um, to help with patient en engagement and experience, you know, please um, chat to us or send us an email. And um, I know that uh, we have a, a presence online as well. If you're in social media, um, I wouldn't recommend doing too much of that, but um, but you could certainly tweet us or send us a Facebook message and. You know, um, we're committed to keeping you all in the loop, as it were, and um, other ways to do that, um, we're open to suggestion. Thank you. Um, uh, Jeremy, uh, a couple of questions where patients, I guess, are being told they may be having their clinic move from the sort of York Street campus in New Haven to some of the care center sites, and just wanting to be reassured that that transition will be seamless. <laughs> Well, that's easy. I can assure that the, that transition will be seamless. I, I think that um, there's a lot of issues that we have to deal with um, when we think about uh, the patients who are currently seen um, at Smilo um, on York Street campus. 
um, in terms of their exposure to the hospital and to the hospital's needs um, to, to make room for, for sicker patients. And so when we think about how we uh, might address what our patients need, we're gonna move them to safer areas that can accommodate not just the patients, but also their teams. So it, the patients are not moving alone to, to strangers. They will be moving with the, the providers that they know and the, the nurses that they know and the social work staff that they know and they'll be, the, the territory may be different, but everything else will be familiar faces to make that transition as smooth as possible. Thank you. Um, this is a question I think that I'd, I'd actually offer up to both Maureen and, and Dr. Billingsley. And there's a series of questions really, I think that amount to as a health system, uh, are we prepared in general for this pandemic? Do we, do we feel like we have everything in place to deal with what's coming over the next several weeks? And I, I, I may start with uh, both Maureen and Dr. Billingsley on that. Why don't I have Maureen start? She's very much on the front lines of the front lines. And Maggie can, might, be, might like to chime in on this as well. Thank you, Kevin. So, you know, I'll really start by going back to what Dr. Court Mansky just said, right, about it being a seamless transition. So we moved into Smilo, as we all know, 10 years ago. And our move that we made just over two weeks ago now from Smilo over to Verde was absolutely seamless. It was one team, and we have never been more proud to be part of a Smilo team. Nurses, physicians, EVS, everyone who participated, it was truly flawless. So when you ask the question, are we prepared for what's coming? I think we are as prepared as we can be. Um, and we are constantly reevaluating on a daily basis. And there is no more dedicated team to care for our patients. And I'll second that. I was there the day of the move. And I have never been more proud to call myself a Smilo Oncology nurse. It was all hands on deck. It didn't matter if you were gynecology oncology, medical oncology, Hemoncology, oncology surgical oncology. Everybody worked together and we worked together so we can make this transition as best for the patients as it can be. And it went perfect. You couldn't have asked for a better day. And day by day, things change as the reports change, as this changes. So we're working with everybody and working as a team together with management and you know nursing and PCAs and everybody to make it whatever the day brings, we're ready for it. Dr. Billingsley, did you want to add to that? Dr. Fuchs, how can I add to that? <laughs> I agree. Thank yeah. you all. Um, so some questions about, um, and I'll start, this, they're sort of in a theme, but um, one is, um, and uh, perhaps we'll start with Dr. Sanf and, and Dr. Kromansky, are cancer patients more vulnerable when it comes to this virus? Tara, did you want to start? Sure. Uh, yeah, so I think, you know, I think the, the truth is that there are some factors that make patients high risk when they come down with COVID, and one of those factors is cancer. Um, and, you know, I am, we say that in a very serious way, but also the truth is that, um, Within the cancer world, as we all know, um, every person is an individual, and it seems like um, those who are at the highest risk are patients who may be undergoing treatment for, you know, uh, hematologic malignancies such as leukemia or transplant recipients. Um, so we are, you know, very concerned and keeping an extra eye out on those patients. If you are um, on chemotherapy, that's another condition where your immune, immune system may be slightly suppressed. And so, you know, again, we want to take this very seriously. Now, if you're a breast cancer patient and you're several years out and you're on endocrine therapy, that's a, a different situation. And in general, um, we don't consider those patients to be um, at great risk compared to the other populations I just described. Um, Jeremy, I'll let you fill in any gaps there. Yeah, no, I think this is a very challenging question. I, I think that 
um, how somebody gets the virus um, may be the same. But what we really worry about is how serious the infection is when you get the virus. And we know that patients that are undergoing therapy, um, patients that are immunosuppressed, um, either because of their disease or prior therapy, um, patients that have other medical comorbidities, other problems with the heart disease or lung disease, these are all patients that are at a higher risk of a complicated infection from uh, COVID. Uh, and so, but one of the other risk factors is, is again, the exposure and touches to, to the community around you. And that community is, unfortunately, our friends and neighbors, um, as well as the healthcare system. And so one of the ways that we reduce that risk uh, is by minimizing those touches. So the, the, um, the social distancing um, is one way reducing the number of patients that are coming in and out of the hospital and the clinics is another way. Um, and, and intervals between your treatments that can reduce the amount of immune suppression that you may experience. Thank you. Um, let me uh, uh, offer this to uh, any of our clinicians, Maureen, um, Dr. Billingsley, Maggie, among others questions about uh, people getting sort of the more intensive therapies we do, such as bone marrow transplant. Are we still doing those for those people who are in the midst of that? Um, how do we protect them? How are we approaching to those questions? Maureen, did you want to start? Um, I, I I would start by saying that, again, you know, not to be re repeating the same thing, but it is absolutely true that each patient and each scenario is looked at as an individual um, for their care at SMILO. And so individual cases are each being reviewed by the physician teams in, in charge of that patient and making the right decision for the patient at the right time. Kevin, did you want to add to that? You know, I, I guess I would just add that um, in the setting of rigorous treatment, um, we would ask that patients and families be particularly vigilant about any new symptoms, symptoms of concern, um, and let us, let us be there for you. Um, if you're concerned, um, please reach out to us. Um, and what our, our aim is to provide absolutely uninterrupted and ongoing support uh, throughout the entire uh, continuum of treatment. And I think one of the things that we are all mindful of is that uh, we all, all have heightened anxieties during this period. And uh, when there are concerns, it's, it's natural, not only for patients, but for the general public and for us as healthcare providers to wonder what's going on. Are these symptoms I'm having related to, to COVID-19 or to my treatment or to something different? And um, for, for, particularly for folks who are on intensive therapy, let us help you sort through those decisions. Thank you. Uh, Maggie and, and Maureen, uh, questions. Can, we, uh, can family members be trained to do certain procedures at home uh, that would obviate the need for patients coming in? Did you want to start, Maggie? I think Maureen has this question. There are certain um, uh, procedures that we can always train a family member to do. Um, I think one of the specific questions that I had seen come through, that I saw come through, was um, a pick line dressing. Um, could we train a family member to do that? And um, I think it really has to be on an individual basis. I think it has to be reviewed by um, their clinician. And um, I know it's a little scary having like a visiting nurse come in and out. So I think we can work with patients to find out what procedures we can teach family members to limit uh, visitors in and out of their house, but there are certain procedures that they should not be doing and they should leave to a professional. 
Yeah, you know, Maggie's absolutely right. So um, the patient should reach out to their provider and their care team, and the care team will uh, review the feasibility of doing whatever the requested service is, either at home with their family or with ancillary services on an individual basis. Um, you know, Bonnie, uh, other advice, you know, a lot of, uh, we're certainly getting questions from people who are, you know, obviously struggling uh, with, uh, you know, doing the things we ask them to do about social distancing, or I think you put it better in terms of just physical distancing, going through the ordeal of cancer therapy, not necessarily seeing family. Uh, how, how do we, how can they, what else, you've talked a little bit about it, maybe you could elaborate even more what they can do about their sort of well-being. So thank you so much. Um, I think it, it's a very challenging time. These are unprecedented times. And um, I think it really is reaching out to um, patients and families, uh, doing more than uh, you would normally do to make sure people are managing and coping with this more effectively. So I would say if somebody is in the hospital, make sure to FaceTime frequently. If patients are home and feeling isolated, please do the same, make phone calls. Just We just have to make sure that everybody uh, feels together in this and nobody feels alone. Um, you know, oftentimes our, our emotions are um, dictated and dictate and form our physical responses. And so we can have many physical responses because of what's going on in our minds. And we wanna keep that at abeyance. And what we really wanna do is keep calm and reach out, talk to people, let people express their concerns and uh, communicate what they're really feeling. Um, uh, any number of folks can answer this. I'll, you know, whoever wants to volunteer, how does a patient differentiate getting a fever for a reason other than COVID-19 from a fever associated with COVID-19? How do they know the difference? What's it? I'll, I'll try to take a stab at that. And, and I think um, sometimes that, that's hard to do. I, I think that um, fever alone um, may be the only symptom of COVID. Usually there are other symptoms that are associated with that. Uh, symptoms that are more common with either upper respiratory infections or shortness of breath. Um, but sometimes we don't know, which is why it's so important uh, for, for you to reach out to us um, if you have a fever um, so that we can give you some direction, um, get a little bit more history about what else might be going on um, to figure out whether you need to be evaluated, whether testing is appropriate so that we can figure it out. Um, Dr. Billingsley, what should a, if, if a patient finds out, you know, gets a phone call from somebody saying, oh, by the way, you know, I, I, was, I saw you the other day and I've now developed COVID-19, what should a patient do when they've been told that story? Well, I guess the first, uh, <laughs> The first thing I'd say is um, <clears throat> take a few deep breaths and know that you're probably going to be okay um, and not panic. Um, you know, one of the things that is important is to distinguish uh, kind of a passing exposure, which is unfortunately altogether too common from a more intensive sustained exposure. And what do I mean by that? If your household partner or your coworker who you share a, a small workspace with for several hours during a day uh, test positive, that's a very different exposure than um, someone that you passed briefly in a work area or in the hallway or you shared a, a, a lunchroom with and you were 10 feet away. <clears throat> The, the risk of those exposures is, is actually quite low. That being said, um, I'm gonna go back to the, to the vigilance piece, which is self-monitor. Um, and certainly if it's a sustained ex exposure, uh, the twice a day temperatures is a very appropriate thing to be doing. That alone is not, 
it's not the whole story, but it is one piece of many pieces of information which can help us all pick up on these cases earlier. Um, I think as Dr. Kortmansky says, it, it's pulling all the pieces together. And we, we are aware that it can be scary and difficult to determine what is a treatment-related side effect from what might be something that's more ominous. Um, and it, it, please understand, it's okay to call and let us help you work through it. Um, there's a couple of questions that I think just reflect how extraordinary our patients and families are, that basically are, what are we doing to protect our staff? Which I think is incredibly generous of patients to ask. So uh, Maureen, let me, have, let me have you start with that one and maybe others can chime in. Great, so um, all of our staff are fully aware of all of the precautions for frequent hand washing, social distancing, which we are being very mindful even in the hospital setting, which can take some time and attention uh, for us to remember to try to keep that um, proper footage of distance between us. Um, additionally, um, the appropriate PPE, and while that can be a, a, a changing, ever-evolving target, um, all caregivers who are direct patient care and patient-facing in the inpatient setting at this time are wearing a mask and taking appropriate PPE measures. Um, and, and diligence, we're all being very diligent, and we appreciate our patients being so understanding of the challenges and changes that we've had to make to ensure that we can keep not only them safe, but the staff safe. Um, just to take you through a day in the life of, you know, being a floor nurse and, uh, you know, what it looks like is as I come in in the morning and prior to me even starting my shift, I have to take my temperature. Um, I have to actually record it in a log. Um, then we actually, we have those computers, you know, we work with. Um, I get one that's my own for the day and I completely disinfect that computer and put my name on it. This way, everybody knows I've used it. Um, I'm completely disinfecting it throughout the day. I do not enter a patient's room without a mask. Um, I have a mask on at all times. And what's hardest for me, because I'm a hugger, is the six feet distancing. So we're really trying to practice as staff um, the social distancing. Um, you know, here at Yale New Haven Health, we do practice, you know, 200% accountability. So people have come up to said, you guys are too close. And, you know, we, we say thank you with a smile because all of this is really just to protect our patients. Um, and then at the end of my shift, I have to retake my temperature and log it. So I was not a feb, you know, febrile during my shift. Anyone else want to chime in on that one? You know, uh, let me just add to that. Um, I think the importance of what we're calling PPE, personal protective equipment, is critical. Um, and for now, that that's mainly masks and in certain procedural areas, gowns, face shields, and a more intensive kind of mask called an N95 respirator. Um, one of the things that I think that is appropriate to share is that our health system leadership is working essentially 24 seven these days to make sure that our teams have an uninterrupted supply of, of personal protective equipment, which is, um, which is in short supply around the country and around the world. And, and all of us are pitching in and we're obtaining it from a variety of sources and um, even being creative about reusing and re-sterilizing equipment so that we are not only protecting our patients but protecting our our healthcare providers who are offering life-saving therapy there on the front lines thank you well i know we're at the end of the hour uh, before we uh close any of our panelists was anything that you wanted to bring up that uh we've neglected to address I wanted to just say one thing about inpatient chemotherapy patients, um, because I know there were, had been some questions, you know, will they still be getting their treatments and where do they go? Um, we are at St. Mayfield's now. It is an absolutely beautiful facility. It is, you know, all private rooms. The only thing that's really going to be changing about their treatment is the address. Same quality nurses, same quality floor, same quality, you know, uh, uh, treatment for them. So 
just even though you're not at Smilo, which we will be back, um, you know, you're coming to a really beautiful floor. Thank you. Thank you. Well, as I say, we are out of time. I, I hope that tonight's forum uh, addressed many of your questions. I know we didn't get to all of them, but uh, be certain that we will have other settings to address your questions. And obviously, when you're in clinic, when you call, we're always available uh, to address whatever questions, concerns, suggestions you may have. Um, you know, I think what we've, I think most importantly wanted to get across to all of you is that despite the circumstances, our commitment to providing world-class cancer care remains absolute. Uh, and whatever this virus throws upon us, we are committed to you. Um, and that the dedicated and talented nurses and doctors and pharmacists, social workers, scientists, clinical staff, research staff, administrators, among others, we are uh, you know, guided by our mission to provide compassionate, state-of-the-art cancer care and research. And under no circumstances are we going to be deterred from doing that. Um, so please know that, as you've heard from all of my colleagues, we are always here for you. I want to thank our speakers and panelists uh, at Smilo Cancer Hospital and Yale Cancer Center for what they and the over 2,000 staff do every day. This was really very enlightening. I hope, I think, provide a lot of assurance to our patients. And finally, I want to thank everyone on, who joined this call tonight. Um, to our patients and families, uh, your courage and your perseverance truly inspires all of us. And it, it's what motivates us to confront this great challenge. It's, uh, it's 8 p.m. And frankly, we are now all one day closer to the end of this COVID pandemic. So uh, to all of you, stay safe, stay strong, and have a good night. Thank you. Thank you, you too. Thank you.